Welcome to uh, this fall's fourth and last lunch seminar in our lunch seminar series on biomedical information technology. This time the topic will be big data in medicine and we have uh, Ola Spjut and Emma Lundberg here uh, to give presentations about that. And the first speaker is Ola. My name is Ola Spjut. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me here to present today in this uh, topic, big data medicine. Um, I will give an introduction to one of the products that we work on and um, to quite a large extent this is uh, financed by an uh, Horizon 2020 project phenomenal which I will come into here as well. The topic of my talk is analyzing big data and medicine with uh, virtual research environments and microservices. And uh, Today we have access to high throughput technologies to study uh, biologi biological phenomena on a level that uh, only a few years ago was, was un unimaginable. Uh, people tend to think only of genomics uh, when we say big data, but uh, we have a lot of other fields uh, that are now emerging uh, to, to study biology on a very, very detailed level, generating lots and lots of data. And of course, the big challenge is how we get from this data uh, to insight. This also, of course, presents us with a lot of uh, challenges. We need to store the data. We need to analyze it. Uh, we need to be able to analyze it in a way so that it uh, completes in time. We need to automate as much as possible so we don't uh, need to do manual tasks all the time. Um, we also want to integrate data from the many very different uh, fields and different instruments that generate data. We have to worry about security because a lot of uh, data in this field comes from, uh, uh, has a connection to humans and health. And in the end uh, a lot of uh, is about we would like uh, for example in healthcare to do predictions. All these are challenges. Um, <coughs> I was recently uh, on an, uh, re reviewing another uh, Horizon 2020 project and um, there's a lot of talk uh, right now in Europe and at EC uh, about uh, European Open Science Cloud. And really this builds on, on, on sort of uh, the argument that the vast majority of the data is generated this last year and, and I think that uh, number 90% has been mentioned few times and uh, we really really need a, a large environment in, in Europe and internationally to be able to actually cope with this so that uh, not this data is generated in vain and we spend a lot of money on generating data that is never used and there's a, there's a, so there's a big understanding there's a big momentum uh, that this is really needed and the European Open Science Cloud sort of embodies that uh, uh, knowledge. So I, I would say the time term cloud uh, should be, in this case, be interpreted more wide and not as in uh, computer cloud. Uh, so, so we need this, the, the services, the system, so that we can reuse, share data, find accessible, uh, interoperable and reusable, the FAIR principles uh, are mentioned now everywhere. <coughs> and of course we need the means to analyze these data sets. And how do we do it today? Uh, to a large extent, in, in uh, um, bioinformatics, biology, if we talk about genomics, we, are, we use traditional high performance computing, shared storage systems that originally were defined uh, uh, to a large extent for physics. And, for, and it's been driven a lot by uh, high energy physics, CERN. Um, there are a lot of uh, problems and challenges for, for this uh, uh, that we have um, limited access to resources. Uh, a computer that uh, is defined, I mean, it, it, it has a number of cores, and if you need more than that, you have to buy an extra computer. You have to install all your tools, the tools yourself. In many cases, you need help from, from a system expert to install them. Um, worrying about privacy is always there. And um, it is kind of hard to, to share and integrate data in these systems that are, that are uh, self-contained. You don't own your own universe. There's all sorts of accessibility issues 
uh, in one, many places you have to use command line, Linux tools, and there's no uh, point and click GUI. So another common approach that, that is very, very widely used in bioinformatics is to use internet-based services. You retrieve data and you use uh, analysis tools online. And the, so this is one, just one example of, of uh, a bioinformatics analysis. Um, it's very common to use different set of tools and you connect them and then you, want, you would like to run your data through them to produce some result. And it's not a pipeline because a pipeline you would just reuse all the time the same. These exist too. But when you talk about basic science and, and a lot of uh, computational biology problems, you change this all the time. It's, a, it's, a, it's something you work on. It's not a, 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 do a write once and run many. It just doesn't work that way. And this is a rather simple case in this case. So service-oriented architectures in, in the life sciences, they, they, you really want to decompose, compartmentalize, do one thing, do it well. So this was the, the feeling uh, 10 years ago, I should say, or 2000, maybe 10, 12 years ago, I was part of, uh, an, of other EU projects where this was what we really wanted to do. We, we said everybody, experts, should put up their services, provide, provide the, the, the servers and uh, expose them as web services, the users would then come consume these uh, services through an uh, application program interface um, and they should integrate these services themselves. You have to of course agree on these interfaces, data formats and protocols for this, so the standardization is of course an, a very, very important thing in this. So how did it work out? Well people tried to do this, um, there were many um, successful attempts, um, for a while, the scientists were then believed that they should consume these uh, different services, connect them together and construct these workflows. You would press run, it would drag some data here, run an analysis here, combine it with some data there and so on. So what happened? Yeah, well over time, some of these servers, they weren't always there when you needed them. Some changed their API. So you <laughs> constantly had to update your, your, your workflow and then other services, they, they just disappeared, they were not maintained. Because it, after a while it was kind of boring to, to spend, spend your research money uh, to actually buy a new computer and make sure that it was always running, had the maintenance and so on. So it, in many cases, uh, not in all, but in many cases this was difficult to sustain and led to unreliable solutions. So now, today, we have uh, cloud computing. I'm sure everybody has heard about it. And um, it offers some advantages over uh, contemporary infrastructures. So we can get on-demand elastic resources and services. You don't buy uh, 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 hardware, you rent it per hour from someone that provides it uh, access to it. And this is used a lot in businesses. We believe that this has high potential for science. It's been a really vibrant ecosystem of framework and tools appeared for, for, for using this. And when talking about uh, cloud computing, we have to talk about virtual machines and containers because they are two fundamental concepts in this. And a virtual machine, I think every, most people have heard also, uh, really you have, a, a, you have the possibility to on a hardware, on, on a server, have different virtual machines that have their separate operating systems, separate applications, and you can run, you can pack multiple isolated environments on a single server. Now the problem with that is that it's uh, uh, a lot of overhead because you have to have duplicate the, the operating system for example and it takes quite a long time. You have, you, every time you start a virtual machine you have to boot for example a Linux system. So containers were sort of, uh, I shouldn't say invented to solve this but it has another approach. So it shares the, the, the host operating system, uh, it can also share some, 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 some shared functions uh, and then you, but you still have isolation for the, for the application, so they don't see each other. Uh, they are isolated, uh, but on another level. And Docker is by far the most widely used contain software container implementation. And microservices, we, we talked about services previously, service oriented science, now we talk about microservices. So what's the difference? Well, you can, you can argue that, that there's, uh, it's the same thing. Um, <coughs> but it builds some, it has some, some fundamental changes, but they still has this do one thing and do it well. We compartmentalize, we, we, we take our tasks, we break it into small pieces, and we can then connect them together to form 
some sort of function. They're very easy to replace, language agnostic, um, portable. Uh, and I think that's the big difference between with a microservice and, and a web service. A web service was usually static there. It was idle. Uh, it was listening and for a long time it got no response and the computer was idle. Microservices, you fire up when you need them, it can work for 50 milliseconds, you close it down. They're very suitable for cloud environments, needless to say. And when you scale microservices, if you have certain of them, if, if you would have the, the traditional monolithic, you would have to fire up an entire new machine with the same composition of these uh, services, whereas in, in microservices you can have if you want to scale and add new machines, you can have different numbers, of course. Of here you can have two of these yellow and here you have two of these greens and so on. It's, of course, more efficient to do it this way. But when you do this, you, of course, come to complexities. Um, you need to ship them and you need to uh, handle them and you need to orchestrate them. And we, if you have a lot of them now, this becomes uh, quite challenging over uh, a set of servers. Let's say you boot up 20, uh, 20 nodes and they want to, to distribute 500 containers on this. You come in the, of course you need some sort of way of handling this. So I think there have been, been a, a few uh, approaches to this and I think the most widely used right now is Kubernetes. It was ori originally developed by Google and it's, it's, it's more or less a language for, for starting um, containers managing the machines running them so that you can pack your containers on these machines. That's what it does. Very suitable for microservices. It has a lot of other features as well, but this is, this is as much as I'm going to go into to Kubernetes. Now taking one step further, um, the scientists, for the, this is quite kind of complex for, for scientists still. Um, I work with biologists in too many cases, and in many cases they, they want point and click interfaces. Some we've taught to learn uh, basic Linux, uh, and they, they start jobs on, on high-performance computing clusters like Upmax here in Uppsala. But virtual environments are, of course, uh, would be very nice. It's a, it would be an e a user-friendly access, easy access uh, for a scientific domain. Uh, it has the functionality you need, you boot it up on the cloud. And uh, you can have a multi-tenant uh, virtual research environment where many people log in to the same collaborate. Or you can, you can instantiate your own, a small one that's only yours. Phenomenal is a Horizon 2020 project. Uh, I'm a work package leader in it, um, where we're working on um, providing an e infrastructure and a virtual research environment for metabolomics. Uh, metabolomics deals with metabolite, so uh, very commonly you take, for example, blood or uh, other uh, fluids and you uh, get a snapshot of all the small molecules you, uh, that you use in there. You can, for example, use mass spectrometry uh, or NMR to do this. And in this presentation, I will not talk about the biologics about this. Uh, but it's uh, a, relative, uh, a relatively young field in life sciences and produces a lot of data. And it's also a lot cheaper to get samples than it is for, for, for genomics. And of course, the metabolome will vary if you ye yesterday eight different things if you were exercising or not. Or, and it also varies if you, if what kind of tubes you carry uh, the sample to uh, your instrument as well. So it's a very challenging problem to, to sort out the signal from the noise. But this phenomenon is about provisioning a virtual research infrastructure so that users can carry out these analyses themselves. Um, we would like to be able to use users could start this on public clouds like Google, Amazon, on private clouds, on local servers. And the aim is that in minutes or less than minutes, set up a complete data center. It has everything you need, the storage, the network, the DNS, the firewall, all these core details, so that you can then log in and do your analysis in this. And we really need these high availability, scalability tools then, because uh, this is, this is uh, uh, what we need. Uh, we are using modern and established tools, frameworks supported by industry uh, to reduce the risk. We don't develop these med middleware and we really believe we can offer an agile and scalable environment to use and a straightforward platform to extend. So users should not see this. They should see web pages. They should see uh, GUIN for manipulating data 
and they should be able to work, for example, in a graphical uh, scripting environment like IPython. So we're working on uh, uh, launching a reference installation. So for example, you can log in uh, and click launch, or you could enter your uh, Amazon credentials, log in and launch. And in both cases, you will be presented with this web page, uh, some other buttons it, behind it, backed by uh, well, your choice of number of compute nodes, your choice of storage, and a set of tools that we provide that we guarantee work together. You can combine them because we certify them. Um, In-house deployment scenarios, this is the Phenom Center uh, uh, at uh, uh, the National Phenom Center in the UK. And this is uh, um, just uh, the vision of installing on a, uh, on a single computer in a hospital. And we're working together with Akademiska Hospital here <coughs> and a group there. The same thing, you will see your private virtual... Of course, this will not scale as much as if you do it on, on, on the cloud. But you can still run it and it will look identical. identical. So this is the process. We, we, we build a lot on open source. Source code is dragged to a, a shared system where we build, test all the tools. We package them in two different repositories. And then the users, when they log in, and they, they can just select the suite of tools. And when they select one, it is uh, pulled from the repository, and the user can use it. The user sees nothing of this. But it's important to have this agile development so that we can, in, from a if, if it, we discover a fix, we can go from, from that fix to having it at the user uh, in minutes. We had two major proof of concepts, one at Academic Hospital in the Kultima group, and one with, uh, at uh, Leibniz Institute for Flans Bio Biochemie at Embassy Cloud at the European Bioinformatics Institute, which was more, is more resource demanding. Um, <coughs> the implications for this is we can improve our sustainability. We don't depend on a specific data center. We can start this anyway. Um, reliability, security, since you can start your own private environment on your own local server in your hospital, uh, we believe that, that we sort of shelter the, the contents in, in a much better way than other systems do. Uh, high availability, high to uh, and tolerance, we can have duplicate servers that round robin again ar around them so that if one single point uh, dies, uh, the system will not die. <coughs> That agile development I mentioned that we can really go very quickly from develop to deploy in this sense. And we believe that this uh, will lead to uh, agile science, agile scientists being able to use this. There, there of course, exist many problems still of interoperability. Data, you have to <laughs> agree on data formats. Uh, you need to agree on, on how APIs should consume data and so on. But, but this you always have. And Phenomenal has work packages to work on, on data, on APIs and so on in our domain. So we're trying to provide a good an example of how we do this in metabolomics. Hopefully this will be an inspiration for other fields as well. So <coughs> these are my, my ongoing research uh, on virtual research uh, environments. So of course if we set up multiple uh, VREs, multiple clouds, you would like to federate data between them. Not all data can be in one single place, and instead we should connect them. The same goes with compute federation, so that we should be able to contribute more computers in another center to an environment. These are, these are the things that we, that we work on. And of course, we would, at the same time, we, would like, we, we need to preserve privacy. I mean, this is very challenging. And, and this is something that, that needs a lot of research and work to be able to achieve. But it's very, very important because we cannot resolve this on one, on one location. Everybody agrees on this. These workflows, how we connect these tools together so that they can run. This, uh, this uh, is one of the focuses of my research group. Uh, we're also using uh, big data framework, Spark and Hadoop, so that we can uh, take these components and do it uh, for some uh, very, very sc uh, resource, uh, scalable, what do you say, com uh, computationally demanding resources. And also the data management and modeling around this. Um, I'm, I'm not saying that all of my research group is working on VREs, but it matches very well these components, the, the big data, the data management modeling, and the workflows. Uh, so so um, this is what I would like to say today. Um, I'd like to acknowledge my research group and uh, also some collaborations with, with AstraZeneca and University of Vienna, uh, SNCC Science Cloud, um, and uh, of course,
to a large extent the phenomenal project uh, and our partners in phenomenal here at the Caramba dot clinic at the academic hospital uh, and of course our funders at the end. So that's it all. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Hmm. And do you have any questions? No. <laughs> uh, how open is this and how easy do you feel that it is for someone else to kind of uh, benefit from, from the work that you have done and maybe put it in another uh, environment? Well, thank you for this question. Uh, it's uh, one of the fundamental uh, fundamentals of the phenomenal project is that everything is open source. <coughs> So we, we uh, so all the tools should be open source. All the frameworks we develop open source, and we try our best to to create uh, as as much documentation as we can uh, to to be able to to help uh, others do it. So uh, we would be extremely excited to be uh, to talk to other fields, and we seek out try to find other domains uh, so that we can sort of uh, collaborate on this. So as open as we can, I guess that's. The answer to your question. Yeah, well, <coughs> a big um, problem that I've seen in the open uh, open source communities is um, funding for maintenance, mm. and I saw that that was really one of the mm. problems. Do, do you see any? How, how do you look at that? What what mm. happen there? And all the, I mean, everything may, needs to be maintained. Yes. It, this is, of course, uh, the grand challenge of all, of more or less, or I should say, all EU projects that develop something, some sort of sort of framework. How will it be sustained? And <coughs> we believe that uh, we have a, f a few. Um, uh, what should I say? We made a few decisions to sort of try to lower the the cost of sustaining uh, this. For example, we we try as much as we can to not develop any middleware. We use other middleware. Uh, so we don't develop the, the, the interoperability layer, so to say. Um, so the cost of maintaining that software um, uh, will be very low. Uh, <coughs> there, of course, always needs to be uh, a core that needs to be maintained in this, in, uh, in this sense. And we try to minimize that as much as possible. As much as developments we do, we try to push upstream. If we contribute to the Galaxy project, we push it to the Galaxy project. When we develop standards for containers, we're anchoring it into the biocontainers community uh, that has this. Uh, when we have a container registry, we try to get them to host it, so that to reduce as much as possible uh, about uh, that, that needs to be sustained uh, within this project. I think open source is, is of course, uh, something to build on, but I agree that uh, the, the, there will be always um, some things needed upon that. And I think that our approach to that is to try to um, keep this as low as possible, anchor it as much as possible with the other ongoing uh, infrastructures in Europe, for example, and other open source projects. I think that's the best we can do. And, and there will always be, I don't think that um, Phenomenal will um, sort of take over the world as such. <laughs> and it's uh, what we're doing, we're, sol we're, we're trying to be uh, a proof of principle in one domain where we say that this is an uh, efficient approach to use in metabolomics. Because there are other EU projects that try to solve the general problem of working with hybrid clouds and so on. And they haven't come so far so that they can provide a, an, a, an experience here. So we're working from two different directions, I think, and we will merge in, in the end. Well, we didn't, then there's the problem. I'm really pleased to see that you see the solid climate resources because when mm. charcoal building was measured at large five years ago, sensitive data was not even talked about to, to be able to be used, but mm. it's for solving that we could in it. Oh, I think it's, it's, uh, it's, sti it's still a, a major concern. And I should say that uh, we, we're working also with regulators, uh, for example, that if, we, if you deploy this on a, a cloud, uh, the provi cloud provider, for example, needs to be ISO certified and have, uh, you need to have all regulations uh, and all the contracts in place. Uh, so I think it's, it's a major part still. And I think also yeah, there needs to be some sort of change in, in, 
in understanding and policies. For example, if you go to a hospital and you say that I will, would like to put some data at the cloud, they will sort of immediately just shut off. I don't, they're not really ready yet for this. Although they, I think they, kn they all know that they're using cloud resources in many cases without being explicit with it. Oh. Thank you so much. Um. Thanks.